Hey everyone, it's Alex here. Um, you're listening to Beyond the Grid with me. Hi everyone, and welcome to Beyond the Grid, presented by the new Bose noise cancelling headphones 700. My name is Tom Clarkson, and joining me this week is a young driver whose career is on a rocket ship towards the front of the grid. His is an incredible story. A year ago, he didn't even have a Formula One drive, and his prospects of getting one looked slim at best. He had no affiliation with an F1 team, and he was having to look at other championships in which to earn a living. His world changed, however, when he got a call from Red Bull advisor Helmut Marko at the end of last year. The result was a Toro Rosso seat for 2019, which morphed into a Red Bull racing drive over the summer break. I'm talking, of course, about Alex Albon. There's no doubt that Alex has had to do it the hard way. He was Red Bull's golden boy in karting, but he was dropped from their young driver program at the end of 2012, since when he's had to battle his way to the top. There were many bleak moments along the way when it looked as if he'd run out of options, but he made the most of every opportunity, and he's now not only in F1, but near the front of F1. How bright his star will shine, only time will tell, but he's done everything expected of him since partnering Max Verstappen for the first time at the Belgian Grand Prix, and that makes him a very exciting prospect. We caught up on the eve of last weekend's Italian Grand Prix, where once again, he impressed mightily. Alex was candid, engaging, and very interesting. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Alex, great to have you on the show. Welcome. We're sat in the Red Bull Energy Station. It's race number two at Monza. Have you got your feet under the table? Um, not really. I feel like <laughs> this whole F1 thing is still not under the table. Um, getting used to it, being kind of chucked into the deep end, that feels like. But um, enjoying it, it all feels like a blur, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, nothing really feels that real. So uh, What, the last week or the whole season? I'd say the, se- the beginning of the season felt like that. And then you kind of get to grips with Formula One and then you feel quite normal about it. You kind of join the circus, let's say. And then I got used to it. <laughs> and on, from, from Thursday through to Sunday, last week in Spa, it did feel very blurry, let's say. But what, yeah. What's been the biggest thing to get used to at Red Bull Racing as opposed to Torosa? Um, I wouldn't say there was one thing in particular. It's just mainly the noise, the, the noise of media and things like that. So the actual driving stuff, it's always the thing that comes most natural, I think, to any driver. And that was the case for me. The driving, it does feel different, yes, but actually it's more all the talk, the press conferences that you do. <laughs> the uh, And yeah, just the, the amount of people that kind of, I mean, the first day coming in, obviously getting photographed and that kind of thing, it's all a bit different to what I'm used to. Intimidating? Um... A little bit, yes, but more just, it's kind of a reminder of what's happening because when I did get told that I am moving up and all that kind of thing, I'm at home or, okay, that time I was in Austria, but I speak to my mum, my dad, and that's really it, that's that's my group. So I, I kind of rested for the whole two weeks in on my sofa at home and then took my flight to a spa and suddenly you can imagine that I have a few people I'm speaking to during a during the summer break, but once you arrive to the track and everyone kind of hits you, it, it, all these cameras, then you you kind of realize in a weird way when you're at home, you're in your own little world, and it's the other way around that the F1 is the, the reality of it, and you see kind of the presence of everyone. It's that kind of zero to hero kind of thing. I, no, I wouldn't it... call it zero to hero. I don't think it's a heroic thing, but I do think. Um, yeah, it, it it's let's say, I wouldn't say I, I was a nobody in Toro Rosso, but um, let's just say that the 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 audience and everything picks up. So, yeah, you, I felt quite happy in my little bubble in Toro Rosso, where I, I'm I am still the least followed driver, I think, like in all kind of media accounts. Ah, which give maybe, it time, <laughs> give it time. Which I think Red Bull was probably unhappy about. But um, I quite liked it. You know, I could go around, I could walk around doing my own thing. Even today or yesterday flying into from Heathrow, suddenly it's a bit more different, let's say. A bit more more people recognize you in the airport. So yeah, it is different. But um, I wouldn't say, I, I, it's weird. I wouldn't say I, I particularly like it. 
but I just kind of get used to it. You kind of have to, don't you? Yeah, exactly. I think that's the only, only I was way saying, like, it. for me, it's, it's always been this thing that Formula One is the reason why, or driving is the reason why I like Formula One. It, that kind of out, outer stuff, I don't really like. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the driving. Um, sure. How much of a step up was, was Formula One compared to what you'd done before? Because you hadn't even tested a Grand Prix car, had you, prior to yeah. moving to Toros? Yeah, so when was winter testing? Winter testing was around February, March. And yeah. um, I got told about this whole movement in Abu Dhabi. Um, and I was too late to get a seat or anything, a seat fit done for the test prior to that, or post that. So there was, there's always a post-season test after Abu Dhabi. And I really wanted to do that test, obviously. Um, I know there was only like one or two days before I actually got told that I, I was going to be an F1 driver. But of course, you want to have kind of a something to think about over the Christmas and winter break. But being told so late, it was it's very much a little bit like what it was like in summer break, where your mind's just overthinking, oh my God, you know, I'm in F1 now and I haven't done anything and I, I don't know what to expect. So there's a lot of anxiety coming into the first test that I did. And um, it's weird. I had a spin anxiety actually. Anxiety that you wouldn't be able to do it. I remember Michael Schumacher at the start of every season used to say to Jean Todd, can I just have a private test on my own just to prove I can still do it? Even yeah, when he was crazy. a multiple world you know, I And I heard about that and that made me feel a lot more comfortable. <laughs> I, 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 but what I, were the anxieties for you? It was more just, firstly, every driver kind of believes in themselves, but it's changes, let's say, driver to driver. And I think um, coming into the year, I knew I was up against Danny, who's got a lot of experience and I know is very quick. And let's say just my previous history doesn't really show anything. Um, all these guys in F1, they've kind of won everything they've come through. And I, I haven't had that. So I felt like in F2, I was doing a very good job and I felt like I was one of the top drivers in the championship. Um, but that's Formula 2. And I, I have quite high standards and I really thought there's maybe four or five drivers in F2 drivers who who can really go on to to become at the top of their game in whatever championship they do but at the same time formula one there's 20 of them and um it's just yeah i never kind of underestimate anything it's always like these guys are, are who they are and they're as big as who they are because of what they've done so yeah it was uh kind of it was that was more the feeling was like I hope I'm not just going to drive around in winter testing and I'm going to be <laughs> a second off the pace and that's that and I'm going to struggle for the for, for the whole time and I just wanted time to at least get up to speed. It was weird but um, I did that first test and I span, I actually, I span on my very first lap, the out lap coming into the, out of the uh, starting the test <laughs> And uh, which is <laughs> terrible. I mean, we came out the pit lane. I, I can say it now, but cold tires. Cold tires. Um, it was like four degrees in Barcelona. Danny did the first day. So normally that was the whole reason was I'm going to go into a car, which has already been proven. But we had a, an issue with the steering. So I could barely keep the thing in a straight line. And so I got really scared. I was like, oh my God, what's going on here? And uh, they said, okay, just make it round. Just drive slowly. But when you do drive slowly, the tires really drop off. And so I was in like fifth gear and it was the most slow, it was the slowest, most stupid spin ever. And I almost hit the wall even. Um, and that was kind of my introduction to F1. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. And it, that point hit me. That was the bit when I realized I was in F1 was I, I got into the recovery truck. It came to the pit lane and there was like a hundred photographers waiting for me. And I was like, wow, <laughs> okay, here we go. You know, this is, this is what it is. Um, and yeah, after that, the test went really well and I kind of took a big weight off my shoulders and uh, felt a lot more relaxed. I think the trick, isn't it, when you come back to the pit lane in the recovery truck, keep your helmet on. Exactly. <laughs> says, my helmet was on. What... I walked right to the back of the <laughs> yeah, carriage. Exactly. Didn't, didn't you don't show anyone to anyone no. do that. You know, what, what's, what sounds even worse <laughs> is so I was destined for Formula E before Formula One. Yeah. And um I did the exact same thing in the Formula E car. I crashed on an outlap, like my first time at the track. And uh, again, it wasn't actually my fault, but it still happened. 
So <laughs> this sounds like <laughs> I, I hope any future teams aren't listening to this and thinking, oh my God, this guy's a maniac. But um, I've been through that experience before. So I wasn't actually that stressed when I did it in Formula One. And uh, yeah. And then just what the confidence built throughout that test. And did you feel ready when we got to Melbourne after just four days in the car? No, no, not at all. I think um, you can't be ready after four days. You can do as much sim- simulator as you want. You can in terms of exploring train as much the as limit, you can. Had you, did you, were you confident you knew where no, the limit was? No, no. I felt like um, I had a good idea of how to drive the car. The pace was there, which was also a good thing. But um, that was four days of driving that we did in Barcelona. So you can really build up to it. You, you arrive to Melbourne, you have three free practice sessions and then you're straight into qualifying. And I knew it would take me time and it was just coming into Melbourne, how long would it take me to start to feel comfortable in the car? And it, it did not until the last run in qualifying, pretty much. And we qualified, I think, 13th, which wasn't too bad, I think. It, in fact, it was in front of Danny at that time, which I was like a second off him <laughs> the whole weekend. And then I kind of pulled it out the bag. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was one of them things. It's so weird to me how... Now, Formula One, they're trying to reduce all this testing for us, for all these, all these upcoming, save money, basically, to, to, for everything for, for, for the next few years. And it's completely the wrong thing, in my opinion, because especially for rookies, you can imagine, I'm nowhere near ready. Truthfully, I wasn't ready for Melbourne. But you could, there's, there's no other option. You can't do anything about it. So, and they want to reduce that even more. So... Yeah, I think something needs to be done about that. But yeah, that's a different story. How long did it take for you to feel ready? I feel like uh, every race I'm learning something new. And especially with Toro Rosso, it's kind of like the beginning was me kind of learning the car and learning how to drive a Formula One car. And then let's say midway through the, let's say six, seven races into the, to the year, I really started to understand then what the car needs to be quick. And... F1 cars now, they're so refined that little things with setups and all that kind of thing, they're making such big differences to your performance. Maybe things which you can't even do on driving, but you speak to your performance engineer and he'll tune little things for you in certain corners. And that gives you so much lap time. And if you don't have the experience, you don't know what to do with the car. Um, And that was where I was starting to really develop, I think, as a driver. Um, And I was kind of understanding, you know, firstly what is the window for the car to be quick in? And then secondly, how do I get it into that window? Um, and I think that's really where these experienced drivers like Lewis and even, you can even say Max now in doing, doing however many years he's done, um, Sebastian. And that's, I think, where they really excel at is they know what they need to tell the team to, 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 to make the car fast. And do you know where the window is on the RB15? no. Not at all. So, so that's that's. So you can go through really. a weekend like Spa, have a great race, yeah, finish fifth, and you're still not confident where the window is. Yeah, no, no. no. <laughs> so, it, to me, it's hard to explain this on a podcast without showing you my hands. But I feel like my my rate of learning is is this kind of a parallel or diagonal line, let's say. Um, and a lot of this this is driving improvement and feedback improvement which kind of gets me to the point of where I am now and when you go into the Red Bull car it's almost like you have to start back again and re-understand firstly how to drive the car where is the window because the window in a RB15 let's say what how what makes this car quick is completely different to the Toro Rosso car and so what about the people you've got around you in the team Max has he been helpful in terms of explaining how to get them, I mean, I think um, we don't speak about. It's not like Max is like, "Oh, Alex, come over here. I'll show you how to do this corner." Um, it's more like he will go first in briefings and stuff like this. I'll listen to his comments. I'll listen to how he interprets kind of the car and, and what he wants to go quicker. And even just listening to how he speaks to the team and how they communicate because there's a different vocabulary in in each team really especially let's say Red Bull which is a very British team there's a lot of British people inside um Toro Rosso was Italian it was a very big mix so just the way that you communicate you have different words um so that's where the learning comes from more 
kind of fly on the wall stuff rather than uh, yeah asking Max. Max, what do you do around this corner? I, I need to I need to understand because you're very quick around there. I remember Sterling Moss saying once that you it's got to intentionally sort of mislead your teammates. Yeah. Say, oh, I break yeah. there. Or it's exactly, that yeah. that's yeah. dangerous. Yeah. That's yeah. honestly dangerous, and I think uh, that's why you never ask, and at the same time, you never. <laughs> Give back advice. So yeah. How would you describe your relationship with Max? You've known him a long time. Sure. Yeah. Are we. I we, mean, you said friendly, but yeah. Is it possible to be friendly well, with? Well, I say arch friendly rival? as in we knew each other from 2010. Actually, 2009. I first knew Max. Max was so young that he wasn't even allowed to race with me that year. But he was testing with us. You just see this guy coming to the track with with his dad and. He would be very quick, but then he would go home after Thursday because he was he was too young to race. Um, so that's how I first knew him. And then 2010, that was like my second year in the in the in this what was called KF3, which is a, a karting series. And I was kind of the experienced one. I was the Red Bull backed driver. Kind of had it all going for me in that sense. Um, and Max was the young gun. Um, we fought pretty much the whole year. We had some. Some crashes, we had some fights, um, all good stuff though. He beat me to the, it was called the WSK Championship. And then I won the European and the World Championship. So you could say, <laughs> you could say I got the better of him. I but, thought uh, you were very modest the other day in the FIA press conference <laughs> when we were talking about 2010. You never mentioned <laughs> no, that you won I, that. I, I don't yeah. like speaking about that stuff. You are I feel very like, modest. Yeah, I, don't, I, I cringe at myself when I even say do something you, like that. Do you think though, having sort of known him for so long and had that racing experience with him, does that sort of help the relationship now? Because there's a sort of underlying respect between I the think, two. I yeah. think, yeah, I think there is. And I think, um, yeah, there's no... There's no games or anything like that. I think we, I know how, kind of how Max is, and I know how I still know him in the way his personality and kind of his, the way he works just through that year. And even I know him from from years after that, just bumping into him in a, a few times. So, yes, I think so. Um, but yeah, the, in the end, it doesn't really change too much the communication. What about Christian Horner? Team principal here at Red Bull. Um, how obviously you've been you're part of the Red Bull family all season. So how well do you know him? Has he given you any advice about the way the way we do things at Red Bull? Yeah, so he was obviously he was the first one to call me when when I got announced, and uh, yeah, he was uh, happy for me. He clearly, you know, he he understands the driver. He is a racer himself, so he kind of knew. You can be excited, but of course he knows that there's a big pressure increase when you do get the call up. And I could tell he was kind of coming me down on that side of it, um, telling me to switch off my phone and, and just kind of ignore as much as you can and, and don't look at the media. So it's really nice to have that kind of driver's eye on a lot of these things because I think the media will, will, will see it as a, Alex is very excited to be in Red Bull. And that is the case, of course, to get this opportunity is crazy, but it does bring a lot of kind of expectation to it which I think the people who really know racing understand and that's that's someone like Christian is it fair to describe your relationship with Christian is is it like paternal almost his yeah it's just someone to to speak to because you can tell he does have that presence about him but he's very calm and and friendly in the way that he does speak about things so Spa was a good one where it was just there was really no expectation at all it was really um, him telling me, you know, just relax, don't don't think about anything, just yeah, finish the race and we'll see. And it's kind of nice to know that because obviously you don't want to be told get get on the podium, please, <laughs> kind of thing before in your first race. While we're talking about relationships, Pierre, um, obviously very difficult moment for him. Yeah, um, sure. have you discussed it? Um, I wouldn't say we we speak about it. Um, you could imagine that it is a small atmosphere not a stressful atmosphere but you I also feel like if I go up to him and say anything it's it almost looks like I'm t taking the piss in, in a doesn't weird way it doesn't need to be said yeah almost. it doesn't need to be said yeah. and I don't want to yeah. offend him at all and yeah. I don't want to act like I'm happy or or you know don't want to give him like this thing that I'm lucky mate if you know what I mean that kind of thing I don't, I don't like that kind of thing so kind of just stay away from speaking to him about little things and I know he was very close to Antoine so I just said sorry about everything and that's the only thing we've really spoken about um, in terms of actually 
the driving and everything like that. Uh, not really. I don't, I don't want to kind of make any... No, totally understandable. Any, yeah. Now, what about Dr. Marco? Sure. Um, <laughs> he's an intriguing character, You need character, to get him on the podcast. It? Are we getting him on the podcast? Uh, hopefully one day. <laughs> I um, think it'll be a good one. I think, yeah, think there'll be a lot to say. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you'll get a few views for that one. Um, I mean, tell me about your relationship. When did you first meet? We first met... Are we talking okay, donkeys years so ago? I, I, would, I actually remember the first time. We met in 2009. That was like my first time being in the karting world. So I, I was a Red Bull back driver, but I was more back through Red Bull Thailand, not through the motorsport side because the junior team doesn't really sponsor or support the karters. It was more single seaters at that time. Um, but he came in to have a chat with me in, in Milton Keynes and... So Milton you Keynes, could, so what, which bit of Milton? It came to your home? Oh, or? no, no. To uh, I wasn't living in Milton Keynes at that time. I do now, but back then I was I was living in uh, Colchester. So, so boy, Marco came, Dr. Marco came... He came to, to the factory. So you went to Red Bull Factory? I went to the Red oh, Bull okay. Factory. Um, we sat down at his t- round table in his office. Or he, does he, from what I understand, he, he, he uses Christian's office to do his stuff. Would that be it? Okay, anyway, so we, we had a meeting... Um, <laughs> just leave it at that we and, had a meeting uh, we had a meeting <laughs> of course I could tell he was intense so you were what, 13 at the time or something I was yeah no less I was, yeah 12, 13 and I could uh, it was intense I remember that um, but I had my family there and it was just a, just a normal chat kind of asking how, how how it all went and then let's say when I first properly knew him was we, we had a shootout in 2000 and, end of 2011 um, in Portugal and it was like four or five of us doing this shootout. My, that caveat, Danny, was, was, was a reference driver at that, that day. That was like my first day in a single-seater car. And obviously... What, what car was it? Uh, Formula Renault. So you could imagine, it was like, my, very, it was really my first day and we kind of got into this shootout and I was useless. <laughs> I was terrible. And uh, I was like, wow, okay. Um, that's that then. Um, but... Why, why what went still, wrong? Because I'm quite intrigued. You're so good now and yet that that move <laughs> so bad then. No, no, that's what i mean is 2012 yeah was a was a really hard season yeah. wasn't it that move up into formula renault and it's weird i mean you were so good in karting you're so good at formula racing and yet formula renault was it that car specifically <sighs> that car it's weird you can be very good at karting and very bad at single seater racing it doesn't necessarily cross over that well it is very much like you do your single karting stuff, you go into single seaters and some guys get it very quickly. I think Max would be a very clear one who gets it, um, but others take a long time um, and myself included. And I think people also think the guys that don't, that do take a long time, don't have the raw talent, which you can kind of understand, right? I mean, if you see a guy just jump into a car and just be quick straight away, that looks a lot more promising than a guy who's, took two years to understand a car and that was kind of me I didn't really I didn't have a lot of confidence back then um kind of took a heavy hit personally in my life I think people who want to search it can but uh yeah it wasn't an easy year for me and um a lot of things going on at that time so my focus wasn't really on the racing at that uh during that moment during that year um which definitely didn't help my performance um and at the same time I was by myself in the team the, the team were bankrupts, um, so it was all very messy and uh, yeah, it, it was just not a good, not a just not a good time for me. It was definitely the darkest year of, of my life, and uh, obviously results weren't coming. So it did take me a while. I would consider the 2013, the year after that, as my first proper year in 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 single seater racing, and that year didn't go great, but was showing signs of potential, and then it was like a switch from 2014 onwards it all started to click and um as i said before i wasn't the one to win championships but um i also just because of where i was and who i was i didn't have opportunities in good teams and i kind of had to start a little bit it's a little bit like kind of spirals a bit doesn't it it does and And it people forget that single junior level racing is just the same as as top Formula One, I'm, you're in the top team. And, Alex, I'm quite yeah. intrigued how, as you say, t- 2012 was a difficult year. But it's funny how 
as a driver, you can be affected by what's going off, going on off track in terms yeah. of if, if, if home life isn't sorted, yeah, it can sure. affect your performance as a sportsman, can't it? It, that, it can. And it's just because your mindset's completely different. Like, um, yeah, you, 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 your priorities weren't on having a bad session in, in qualifying. It was more other things, let's say. So, yeah, it, it, it does definitely affect it. I think what people don't realize is it affects you without even realizing it affects you as well. Um, and that's the kind of the dangerous bit is um, I think when you don't have things going positive in your life, it will affect you even if you don't think about it. And that's kind of one of the things which even I remember Aki um, from Hintzel was, Aki Hintzel, was yeah. telling me from, from the very beginning was you need, you need to have a positive kind of ground. Um, all the people around you, you get on well with to, to perform because if you, one of them aren't, isn't right then then it's not going to go well so yeah it, and that that really was the case it was a uh, one of them things where it's just you I was going into races um just not focused on on the driving and more focused on if everyone else was okay to be honest and that was about it and and helmet doesn't strike me tell me if I'm wrong as a man to put his arm around your shoulder and <laughs> <laughs> I think he understands drivers better than people think I think he he just doesn't show it. Um, he is a racer, but of course he's a hard racer. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I got dropped at the end of that year, but there was no reason. I mean, if you look at my results, I think I, I didn't score any points in 2012. So I didn't get a chance to, to do another year with, with Red Bull. But um, I mean, how tough yeah. was that moment for you in terms of you've lost the Red Bull backing? Sure. There's just start, it's, yeah, it stuff's was. not going not going right it was tough did you ever think about yeah. stopping yeah I th at that point I knew or let's say everything about 2012 meant there was no chance for anything else to happen so I remember the call just like it was yesterday I know where I was I know I was in a hotel and all that kind of thing F from Dr. Marco from Dr. saying Marco. what did he say How is he uh, just... it was nothing it was just obviously I knew it was coming because a, a driver got dropped the, the day before I did and uh he called me and fashionably early, let's say for him. And it was just like, listen, of course we've seen your results and it's, it's not what we, we expect or, or, or want. And of course, I mean, they're chasing for the next Formula One driver, not, not someone who's, <laughs> who's finishing P20 every race. So that was kind of it. Um, and yeah, that was that. And it was quite late in the season. It was around December. That's the hour season that ends very late in Formula Renault. And, uh, kind of finished the phone call and it was a bit like well what, what is there to do I, I don't have any money anymore <laughs> and uh, there's not really a place for me to um, go so luckily um, one of my karting friends um, gave me a contact which was uh, Gwen Lagu who's now looking after the Mercedes junior team but back then he was work he was with um, Jenny the uh, gravity um, which is a uh, was Lotus back in the day um, and uh, kind of got it all sorted out and just about got a seat for the next year and that was kind of like another um, another difficult year but kind of got some contacts through through Thailand and and that's really where it all started to to take off and um, started to feel more secure in in my driving but also just being able to to race we'll hear more from Alex in a moment since F1 Beyond the Grid started in 2018, we've been telling you about the amazing Bose QuietComfort 35.2 wireless headphones. Well, guess what? Bose has continued with their relentless pursuit for innovation, and they bring you something brand new. The Bose Noise Cancelling Headphones 700. These new headphones from Bose deliver everything that you would expect and more in a stylish new design. Smart headphones that give you easy access to everything you need. From voice assistants to searching maps, messages and understanding what's coming next in your day. You can do all of that hands-free as well as confidently take a call with the most powerful microphone system for voice pickup even in busy and noisy environments. But one of the coolest features that Bose Noise Cancelling Headphone 700 includes is Bose AR, a first-of-its-kind audio augmented reality platform that makes astonishing new audio experiences possible. 
Available in black or silver colors, the new design incorporates intuitive touch controls so it's easy to alter the volume, change your music selection, make calls, as well as everything else, as you enjoy Bose's world-renowned and adaptable noise-canceling technology across 20, yes, 20 hours of battery life. So make sure your head's up, hands free, and your ears are amazed with the brand new Bose Noise Cancelling Headphones 700. Now let's get back to Alex. Two standout seasons in the junior formulas. One was 2016. Sure. Um, Runner-up to Charles Leclerc in GP3. And then, of course, yeah. there was F2 last year. Which was the better season for you, um, 16 or 18? I'd say 16 was a breakthrough year for me because I felt like uh, back prior to that, I had no real results at all. And suddenly I was entering 2016 with a team that I knew could win. And that was very different to the teams I was with before. They, let's say the teams before, they were very good, but they, they had no history of winning, let's say. So this was ART, was it? Yeah. This was ART. So mm-hmm. I was with ART. We had myself, Charles, Nick DeVries and Nerey Fukuzumi. So it was kind of the four prospects of junior formula it was kind of like that year it was like labeled the super year for for junior drivers um and let's say people who knew me expected me to do well but even myself i wasn't like that i was like oh my god you know here we go i'm i'm up against it now um and if i'm it was kind of that thing where am i gonna sink or float kind of thing and uh went out there and started to win races get pole positions and I was fighting with Charles to the to the last round of the championship I was leading the race actually and I crashed <laughs> so uh it w- it was a really good year for me because people just didn't expect or, or know me and suddenly started to pick up a lot of interest so yeah it was a great year um, I think certainly in the F1 paddock that was the year when people were, oh exactly exactly and, and that's kind of what you need and that's why you do well now it's called Formula 3 and Formula 2 because you are in the spotlight of the of the big boys and uh, them kind of performances they, they they notice, so yeah. And what about Charles? Charles, yeah. We, we get on really well. Like um, it was, Even when you were battling for the championship? It, yeah, even, even f- battling for the championship. It, it was a really cool atmosphere. You had f- four drivers in the team who were really quick. Um, the data was, everyone was quicker in another corner. There was not one corner where one guy just was quicker everywhere. So it was for driving it was amazing and the atmosphere was good as well like um there was a strong rivalry there but it was all really fair and um we knew each other really well off track as well um would you hang out really with Charles? would you go on holiday with him would you we wouldn't hang out like that we wouldn't go on holiday but we would hang out we'd go like on the driving range before sim days and we would do like uh just normal things go on simulators like i remember friday before <laughs> before qualifying or this the thursday night before qualifying in Silverstone, we were having some sim sim races just just for fun. So yeah, we did get on well. Um, we all all four of us did, and it was it was a good moment because I think uh, that's kind of what yeah it was it was just a a moment where I really felt I was I was improving as a driver. And at this point, were you on the phone to Helmut Marco and reminding him of your success and <laughs> no. you haven't forgotten me? So. <laughs> Because, because, do you have? Did you have a manager at this time in your career, or um, was so the manager? So, Wayne was still looking after me. He was still looking after you. He okay, was still yeah. looking after me, but um, not no F one real really connections. It was just me driving, and uh, it was a quite a quite. It was just a small team of us doing our own thing, um, and yet the thing is, is is truthfully speaking, there's a lot of um, teams where. You could join, yes, but they do make you pay kind of thing. So there's no point being in a team where they, they, there's not much benefit to, to joining and, and uh, you don't get much from it. So we were kind of keeping our doors open at that point. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it was the right thing to do. But what about the relationship with Red Bull, given that you're sat the other side of a table in Red Bull gear? Because I suppose what I'm building up to is... This call that you got in Abu Dhabi last year, was it a complete bolt out of the blue or is it something that had you been nurturing that relationship? And Because um, I remember Brendan Hartley the year before, I think, had picked up the phone to Helmut and said, well, have you, what about me kind of thing? Yeah. And, uh, so I, so I, that's I, the story that went around anyway. So there was that chance. Let's say, okay, it was around Spa 
No, it was around Hungary actually. When last, I think last year, last year when Ricardo left Red Bull and and there was that big silly season thing happening, and um, because back then I, that was all done. I was already signed for Formula E, and and that that was that. I was uh, destined for for some electric racing. Let's say I'm quite intrigued that you you jumped so early to Formula E. Yeah, or... because their, their season starts very early. Their season starts at, in like November, so they kind of go across the winter, whereas F1 goes across the summer. Um, so the decisions had to be made quite quickly. And August last year, F1 didn't look like it was on the cards. Is that yeah? Is exactly, that the point? I mean, yeah. I, that's the thing. Was I? Uh, I actually asked I, exactly like Brendan. I called up and and I just asked, "What's the situation? And um, how is there anything? You know, before I, before I really sign anything with Formula E, is there is there a, a way for me to get in?" And it was a no. So. Helmet said no. Yeah, it was, was, okay. it was a quite right. a clear no. So I was like, well, okay then. Um, that's that then. And I, I went the Formula E route. So that was me done. And, and I thought, you know, okay, we, we, I've kind of ended my Formula 2 year, which was a good year as well. I mean, very tough start of the year, um, financially speaking. But again, kind of a comeback year and, and kind of proved myself little things like that. And uh yeah, I was happy, and and Formula E really is the next best thing to Formula One. So, I was a I was going to be a rookie in that, and uh, already did some testing. Then yeah, came to Abu Dhabi, and as you said, it was a there was more more talking, but it wasn't from nothing to do with me. It was just noise from the paddock, um, and I didn't expect anything like that. Uh, I kind of obviously was hoping for it. And I had a really good weekend in Russia, in Sochi, which was the race before Abu Dhabi for us. Um, but again, there was nothing there. And I thought, okay, fine. Um, I mean, in Sochi, for example, did you come into the paddock, F1 paddock, and, and yeah, no. drop in for a coffee? Or yeah, anything? No. There was a bit of that? Or? I'm so... I was so out of the loop with this stuff. Like, George and Lando, they were obviously so well connected with Formula One. I really wasn't at all... To me, it was just like, I'm in the F2 paddock, I'm doing my thing. And yes, I'm, uh, truthfully, I most probably should have been doing that kind of thing. But I just, I saw it as, there is no team that's going to take me in the whole paddock. I, the, obviously, Mercedes and Fry, they have their drivers. They had Charles, they had uh, George. McLaren has Lando. And all the other teams are kind of customer engine teams. So if you see it with Esteban, with Force India, you know, the junior drivers get deals, get into teams through deals from their engines, let's say. So that's kind of the way it works. The only team that would ever have been possible was Toro Rosso. And uh, that was a clear no. So I didn't, I saw it as like a a thing of, okay, well, you know, I've already signed my contract with Formula E and, and that's my kind of, that's what I'm doing now. Um, and w- yeah. at that point, was please you're you're a professional racing driver. You've yeah, been but paid it, I to wasn't. Race. I wasn't. It was a very weird feeling. I, I remember the day I signed it. It was in Hungary. It was on like the Saturday night, Sunday night, and uh, it's kind of that thing of you've chased. A, you can imagine any driver. I think four years old. I was dreaming about Formula One, and you kind of work yourself up. And and I was getting close to that, closer to that dream. And Formula Two starts to go very well, and all that kind of thing. And then there's no, you kind of reach the end of the tunnel, there's nothing there. So you do jump ship and you do go Formula E and when you do sign, it's like, I know in my heart, once I've signed this contract, a Formula 1 team is not going to take a Formula E driver. That's kind of polar opposites cars and, and all that kind of thing. So I've kind of let go of of my dream. So it was I was happy that I've kind of, in a way, thought about my career and how I've been able to get a Formula E drive and and financially or become a professional driver really but at the same time it's like ah, you know i've just let go of formula one how funny yeah, yeah. i can I completely imagine they're completely torn yeah yeah so obviously everyone gives you the messages well done congrats on on signing for formula e. yeah, it feels a bit empty doesn't it, it does yeah it did yeah so so when you get the call in abu dhabi the last time you'd spoken to dr marco was in august yeah that was it. That's mad. Um, and that was kind of, <laughs> that was it. It was a crazy Does he give anything events. away? When he's got good news to give you, like, I'm going to offer you the... Does he, is there something in his 
tone of voice that gives it away? No, or is he... I think, I don't know if he tries to play it cool or if he's just that icy cold, but um, he is very, like even the conversation of me becoming an F1 driver was literally pick up the phone. Okay, what's your situation? Okay, can you do this? Can you do that? This is, can you, can you be here tomorrow? Because that was the Monday morning after Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. I was lucky that I even stayed out that long because normally I would fly back Sunday night. And I was like, well, can I come to the test at least? Because the first thing I asked was, can I test? And it was, no, okay, fine. Can I at least come along and, and see what it's all about? Yeah. And the whole conversation lasted about a minute. And uh, So he doesn't explain what's changed since August or anything like that. It's just, this is what we want you to do. Yeah, no, that's He's, it. That's it. it. There's no kind of, I think... In a way, as a driver, you don't need to know the reasoning why. You just know that you've got to call up. It's your time to to prove yourself, and that's that. Listen, I think you're a very convincing talker. So when I'm going to put this to you now, Alex, okay. so you, you you then get another call um, in August, beginning uh, beginning of the summer break. Sure. And I remember you saying that the conversation that time, because you went to Austria, yeah. was half an hour long. And I'm going to put it to you that do you think he always intended to give you the Red Bull Racing no, Drive when he called no. you out? Or did you convince oh, okay, him? Okay, okay. Did you convince him in the space of that half an hour that this is the thing he needed to do? We were speaking about the year. It was kind of a catch up meeting and um, speaking about next year. Literally, very small things where I'm going to live, what am I going to do? Am I going to stay in the UK? Am I going to go to Monaco? That kind of thing. It's kind of casual conversation for an F1 driver, let's say. It's so uh, rock and roll. <laughs> And by the way, I'm living with my mom and dad, so, <laughs> so that's that's kind of what I am right now. I'm definitely not rock and roll, but um, yeah, that was the conversation. And um, okay, fair enough. I, I I went over to to Austria, and the conversation was done then. But I'm I think it was done by then. The 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 chat was done by then, um, and I was as surprised as anyone really. I really didn't expect it. I mean. My mum is maybe the world's most optimistic person. And she may have thought, oh, you know, it could have been this, could be that. But I kind of shut her down straight away. Like, no way is this kind of thing going to happen. Um, because, yeah, it's just, it didn't, I didn't see it coming really. And uh, and we, that conversation we had in Austria was very much what I told, what he said it would be. We were speaking about all this kind of thing, about, about how was the year gone. And um, I did have also a, a meeting with Christian the Friday before that meeting, again, it was more like a chat up, casual kind of how's the year going and what have you learned, what do you need to improve, that kind of thing. And I don't Do you know. think it was a test? I don't know. I feel like Red Bull's always a test. <laughs> but um, yeah. It, but you, even you when you're having know. that chat, talking about where you're going to live and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Does I know he what not you're give mean. anything away? No, Still. zero, zero. And then it, it's literally <laughs> He'd like... He'd be a brilliant poker player. Yeah, he? he would. And then it's literally like at the end of it, oh, by the way, this is going to happen. And then you're just like, <laughs> you know, okay. Um, and then it's kind of, yeah, are you sure? Yeah, is this really going to happen? Okay, then <laughs> see, you on the, see, you on, see you on Wednesday at Spa. It's kind of that kind of thing. So it, it is very much out of the blue and... Um, you, it's very hard to read. I, f I find Dr. Mark, I, I don't really know when he's joking or not. He does, he had to definitely have a funny side, but it's hard to, to understand what is what. How the world had changed in 12 months for you is... Yeah, I mean, I was saying like, this time, okay, this time last year was, was a bit more stable, but I was really booking my flights on a Tuesday, uh, calling the team on a Tuesday, booking my flights on a Wednesday, and flying out on a Thursday to race. That was <laughs> why each, so each last race. minute. As in, because they were they were they, basically they were eyeing up whether they could get a driver in time to replace me, and if they would pay enough. Oh, money. A driver with money to replace. Yeah, okay. and and oh. firstly a good driver because they they knew I was getting good results at that time, and it was kind of like they were also waiting for me to to see if I could bring money, um, and it was always like a yeah I'm trying I'm trying yeah there's this and that coming which there really was. <laughs> it sounds like I was playing a, a sneaky game but there wasn't it wasn't like that and they're like okay well we'll put you well you got to keep you kind of thing. do you think all this uncertainty and everything you've been through has made you a better sportsman a more resilient person definitely and yes. almost better equipped for the world in which you're now yeah I, I, would, I would say 
let's say pre-2012, I was a um, very sport kid. And 2012 happened, kind of took a big knock and really started at a big low point for me and then kind of got the confidence and everything back up. And then 20, even 2017 wasn't a good year for me, but 2018 kind of, again, started started strong performance-wise, but going through a lot of tough stuff with, with just trying to race. And it kind of built this this feeling like, it sounds weird, but when you're always on the edge of racing or not, you, you really care about it. And then it gets to a point when you feel like, it's not that you don't care, but you just, you get this kind of, this drive and this attitude of, well, this might be my last race, you know, let's give it everything. Who cares what, what happens kind of thing. And you kind of build this, this kind of strong, strong personality, I felt like, especially last year. And um, I have been dropped before, so I, and I have come back. So again, I, I felt like, so what if I get dropped? So what if this happens? So what if that happens? It, you kind of almost don't care about the bad things, about what could happen. And you, you don't go into that negative kind of doubtingness, let's say. Uh, and I think that's kind of helped me this year as well, just not stressing. I, I, I get all these, let's say media even, kind of saying, what if you don't do this? What if you, and it's like, well, I'm not really thinking about that, to be honest. I'm just kind of focused on having a good time and enjoying myself. And are you having a good time? Yeah, I'm loving it. I, I, as I said, I, I, <laughs> the media stuff is always is a, is a learning curve. Let's, that's the most political way I can put it. <laughs> but um, I do love the driving. I love the kind of the environment in F1. You kind of that feeling when you put on your headset and after a, after a session and you've just got all these geniuses kind of chatting amongst each other and, and trying to find solutions. It's kind of NASA feeling and I love it, yeah. What's your greatest strength as a driver? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. I think, um, yeah, I don't know. I'd say I'm quite uh, logical with, with most things. So I think about things. Um, I'd say, <laughs> I'd like to think I'm quite smart in how I drive and, and how I analyze a car. So I think, that's what's probably served me well. And I think that's why without driving a lot of Formula One experience, or let's say not having a lot of Formula One experience, I've been able to get up to speed quickly just from taking it quite logical and, and, and having kind of, yeah, a methodical approach to everything. Mm. And cool under pressure. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> well, uh, so thought, far, yes, but uh, you back, never know. You know yeah, no, I, I feel okay. Was... Yeah, it... It's one of those things where just, again, I think maybe it's that previous, previous experience. Where, where did this passion for racing come from? I mean, was it your, I remember, this is how old <laughs> I am. I remember your dad yeah. racing for Harlow Motorsport. Yes. In the in British Reynolds. Touring Car oh, Championship did, did. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, 1994, yeah, yeah. Alex. I know, I know, I know. He reminds me about that as well. He yeah. reminds me of the good old days. Yeah, um, it was great. I remember standing on the outside of Paddock. Uh, at Brands Hatch and just really? seeing him coming flying through. But, was so, he quick or was he slow? <laughs> <laughs> no sure. comment. I'm sure he was really quick. Watching... <laughs> You've got good genes. There you go, Dad. You got, um, you got a thumbs up. But uh, was how, how involved was Dad in sort of getting you started and yeah. what advice has he given you? Yeah, massively. Um, I was obsessed, completely, completely obsessed with, with, with anything with four wheels till, yeah, from ages four to six. That was kind of... Schumacher was my idol. I used to cry if he didn't win. Um, and yeah, I just what, had I've got read everything. Why Michael? Oh, I don't know. I just saw him as this guy who clearly was so dominant in that period and untouchable, kind of his, 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 his mindset, the way he approached things and, and his kind of just determined attitude. I think it struck, struck me as like, this guy is the best, not just because he's obviously talented, but he works for it. And... Yeah, it seemed like, yeah, just uh, love, love, love Ferrari, love red. Sounds bad saying that, but yeah, it, Is it was. Is it true that you only wore red t-shirts? Yeah, <laughs> I wish I had a photo of my bedroom. My bedroom was red, it was red bed covers, a red bed. So I got my dad to paint it red. Um, I had a red walls, red carpets. Um, yeah, so... You go was into my room, it looks, like, it looks like a massacre's taken place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really bad. You're not still in that same room, are you? <laughs> no, 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 I have no, no. moved out. Oh, I right. have moved out, yeah. 
And I also read somewhere that one of your first words was Ferrari. Yeah, Maybe it was, was that true? So, yeah, so it was Rari. I used to say Rari and I used to say smokes. And smokes were exhausts. So I loved, I loved exhausts. <laughs> Don't know why. <laughs> and I loved Raris. So that was, that was kind of it. And, Did uh, you ever race yeah. Mick? At any never, point? No. never. So Mick, Mick's kind of I know he's just quite before lot, yeah. me. But yeah. I mean, we still just speak. And we, yeah. Do you? So you have a relationship with Mick? A little bit. I mean, he is a bit, as I said, below me, but kind of... We just, we always, and therefore, world's quite small. So Does Mick it know me. that you have this obsession with his know. dad? It's going to be a bit weird. It would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? I love your dad. <laughs> <laughs> sounds a bit, sounds a bit strange. But yeah, going back to it, yeah, my dad was, was, was a big inspiration. He was the guy who got me my first go-kart, got me to my first track. You know that, I don't think it exists that much anymore, but he was my mechanic, my engineer, my driver coach, that kind of thing when I was eight, seven to, to 10. And then... At that point, it gets so serious racing. Even at 10 years old, you're, you're starting to, when you're fighting for championships. Professional teams. and Exactly. Then it's kind of- You need that, proper mechanics, Exactly. Right? And then, <laughs> sorry, dad, you're not doing good <laughs> yes. enough. Hand over the keys, that can, kind of thing. Can you remember the first time you drove a cart? How, how liberating was it? Was it- <laughs> You know, okay, this is a funny story. It, the first for you, time, was it a bit like for the rest of us when we ride a bike for the first time, we feel liberated? <laughs> what was it? No. Like? First time, I was in tears. I hated it. I was in Disneyland, I think. I still remember crying about it, but I just remember stepping into the cart. It was like a mini Formula One cart. I have the photo, actually, on my phone. Why were you crying? I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I was obsessed was with it. Was it not red? It wasn't red. Yeah, maybe that's why. <laughs> but I, I didn't like it. And I, I cried and I walked out. I was like, no, I'm not doing this. And then I, was, I must have been about five. And then uh, when I did get my first cart, seven, um, Loved it, completely obsessed with it. It was a kind what of what brought about that transformation. Just was it an age? Thing? I think it's probably an age thing, and and um, just kind of got scared of speed maybe when I was four or five, and uh, probably quite hard to relate to that kid now. I would yeah, imagine. Given yeah, yeah, exactly. And then uh, that was the thing was we had like a we lived pretty much on a barn, and um, he would my dad would put bricks, kind of be like a figure of eight, and uh, after school just kind of nag my dad. He got the stopwatch out and I would do like three laps of a figure of eight and uh, do that Monday to Friday until I was old enough to go to a go-kart track. And that was that. That's kind of how I learned car control and all that kind of thing. That's amazing. And you got four siblings. Are you the only one yeah. who was into yeah, racing? Yeah, pretty much. My dad did get my sister to try it out. Um, that was a no-go because my, my brother is the youngest of, 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 all of all of us. And he tried it as well, but... I think I was the one who definitely was obsessed with it very early and, and quickly, yeah. And then who's the best driver you have raced on the way up? I, mean, I include karting. Sure. Formula One, who's who? Um, well, obviously I don't know Max well enough right now to say about him, but I've already seen he's very quick in Spa. I think um, Charles would be, definitely. I think Charles had a... When I first went into GP3, it was kind of like a thing where um, he could pull these laps. I think like he did it in Spa, actually, where it's just like, where does that come from? It's like and seven tenths in Spa yeah, over uh, Sebastian Vettel was, and it's it's kind of I had we had that a couple of times in GP3 where it was just like we'd be fighting for pole position, or we'd be trading times, and then suddenly this lap comes up, and you're just like. Where did, where did that come where from? Where does it, when you look at the data, is, it, is there one particular thing? Um, not really. I'd say um, where he's very strong is braking and entry. So kind of that thing of having the rear moving through the corner. So go, going, in, going a bit technical here, it's that, that moment when you're not sliding the rear, but you're, or let's say you're not oversliding the rear, but you're sliding it enough that the car's always moving and you're kind of playing with the steering. It's almost like a drift on the entry, um, which we all do. Does that only work in slow corners or can you do it that? It works mainly, yeah, exactly. So these big braking zones or medium braking zones, um, they work very well. So it's kind of that thing of getting the car straight before you're actually on, at the apex. That's why he was very strong. He had a really good feeling for that. And yeah, and then just purely kind of just normal things like he was always one using more track than anyone. Um, playing with track limits, all that kind of thing. And that's kind of how we, how we, yeah, had a, had a, let's say, a uh, respect for him. Okay. He is, well, 
hopefully many great battles between the two of you coming up <laughs> uh, now look it's been fab to talk to you just i've just talked to you i've just got a couple of questions sure. one is the thailand thing yes um second thai driver in formula one yeah what was prince Bira's full name oh my god you have put me on the spot <laughs> you're not prince, allowed to google it prince Bira, <laughs> obviously <laughs> Would you like prince, me to tell you? Go on. He was Prince. Um, please forgive the pronunciation. You're gonna, here. Yeah. Let, let's see how you prince. pronounce it. You know, I met their fam, like his family, when I was in Thailand um, recently. Last time out. Yeah, yeah. Since you've been in Formula Since One. Since I've been in Formula One. Yeah. Oh wow! And were and they very receptive related. to the idea yeah. of you being in yeah, Formula One? Yeah, they were all really cool about it. Um, and Proud yeah, that you. Yeah. Flying they, the flag. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I didn't even know that at the time. They're just these normal, normal people. And then we're having, because I had an event to do in Thailand and they kind of told I, me. I'm going to make an absolute nonsense of this pronunciation, so I'm going to show it to you. How would you say Jesus. It's, so it's Prince. You, I don't, you, I'm going to. Shall I do it? You can't. Shall I do it? <laughs> Let's hear it. Um, Prince Birabongzi Banu Dej Banu Band. Is that fair? Banu Band. I know. I think so anyway, uh, I'll leave it wasn't you. Meant to be a trick I think question. I'll leave. I think I'll leave you to say that. But it's, that sounds. <laughs> that sounds well, good. Fascinating to know that you met the family and they yeah, that was still really cool. following Formula One. Yes, and yes. And uh, very much. No, it was, it was very cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they had my full support, so it was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. Um, so, a final thing is, what do you got to do to retain the seat at Red Bull next year? What have you? What goals have you been set by Christian? And <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so far. I would say it's quite um, it's quite open actually. I haven't had like a top this, top that, um, be here, be there. Of course, we we want to bring the fight to Ferrari and Mercedes. I think that's that's quite clear. But the main thing right now is just been trying to get up to speed and and not put pressure on yourself and put expectations on yourself so early in your kind of time with Red Bull. So that's been really the focus, and that's that's really what Christian and Dr. Mark have been saying is don't. You know, Max is where he is because of he knows the team, he knows everything about it. So don't expect to be fighting with him straight away. Um, it will take time, and I do believe that as well. So yes, uh, that's how I see it as well. So that's been that. Um, in terms of what kind of what I have to do, I don't know. Truthfully, I think it's just I want to to perform at my best. That's how I see it. See kind of how how I do and. I know I don't have experience like like other people. Um, I do know I'm going to get better, but it's just about kind of giving myself that time and uh, not stressing exactly that very thing of, of not putting targets on myself and just letting the, let's say, the natural evolution um, occur. And, and yeah, if that's fighting for podiums at the end of the year, that's great, but um, I'm not kind of putting myself in that situation. Just keep doing what you're doing. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Well, Alex, pleasure to chat to you. Thank you very much for your time. No worries, really thank you very much. It. Yeah, it was good, it was Cheers. good. I won't listen to it though. I cringe at myself when I listen to these things. So. <laughs> Don't need to. <laughs> you were here. <laughs> I, was here. I, was, I was in it. I was in it. Yeah, it's a top man. Thank you very much. No worries. Cheers. What an incredibly open and honest guy. You sense Alex still can't quite believe his good fortune, but you also sense a steely determination that means he isn't going to let this opportunity slip. I think we learnt a lot during that conversation, and not only about Alex, his thoughts on his rivals, and Charles Leclerc in particular, were fascinating. And the overriding impression I've come away with is of a smart young man who will grow into his role as a front-running Formula One driver and sporting celebrity. Alex, thanks for your time. It was good to chat. And thanks too to Red Bull for the hospitality. Well, that's it for another episode, but we'll be back next week with another big name from the world of F1. Until then, why not subscribe to Be On The Grid if you haven't already, or better still, subscribe and leave us a review. We really do love your feedback and I can promise that we read it all. Plenty of you had something to say about last week's episode with Pastor Maldonado. In fact, some of his comments seem to cause a bit of a stir, and you all seem to agree that he remains as passionate as ever. Thoroughly enjoyed listening to your chat with Pastor Maldonado, says Edward Hunter. He certainly didn't hold back and still wears his heart on his sleeve, but I definitely feel he's mellowed a lot since his turbulent time in Formula One. Loved his passionate recollections. 
I would agree that he's mellowed Edward, and I particularly loved his description of Spain 2012. He remembered it like it was yesterday, didn't he? Well, please keep your feedback coming. We love it. And remember to use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid, and you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, keep it flat out. <laughs>